忧郁。Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount.、Uh, I gave you fair warning last week that it's going to start getting really radical in this portion of our study. So now is your opportunity to run away and hide someplace in the closet or something, or stay as we ask the Lord's blessing on what we're about to hear, that it may be God's word, not my opinion. Not my ideas, but the Word of God, and I'm joined here as usual by my dear wife Alice and my brother Mark. Hi, everyone. You can say hi. Hello. <laughs> say hello back to Mark. All right. So, Father, we do. We just ask your blessing upon our time tonight. We ask, Lord God, that we remember that the goal of our instruction is love, and that your Son Christ Jesus is love. So that at the end of the night. We would, or at the end of the study, Lord, we would just have more understanding of Your love for us and how we should love others. Use Your Word, Lord God, to just shape us and mold us into what You desire us to be. For we know that You desire us to be like Your Son Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, I gave you fair warning last、yes. week. I did. I said we're, we're about to get into, and I've said from the beginning of this study,、okay. which I think well, this is our sixteenth week. In the Sermon on the Mount,、uh, so this is four months, and golly, we're we're almost through with the chapter. But it is worthy of our time to spend and look at this because this is indeed the instruction of Jesus Christ on how we are to live the righteous life that He is calling us to. And I said in the beginning, and I'll say this again: we started with the Beatitudes, a study on the Beatitudes, and I said basically that's the sermon. And the rest becomes commentary, or the rest become. You know, it's kind of like getting instruction. If you if your car was not acting the way you think it ought to be, and you took it to a mechanic, and he says, "Well, gosh, it needs a tune-up,"、mm-hmm. and you say, "Well, maybe that's something I'd like to do." Well, that's great. So now you know. Now you know what you need to do. You know, it's a tune-up. But now maybe he'll help you out by saying, "Okay, here's what you do." You pull the spark plugs out. You clean the park spark plugs. You check the gap. Or I had to go back a long time to give you this. You know, we'll get to the distributor cap. So there's detailed information. The beginning of this is the fact that Jesus wants us to be blessed. He came into this world for us to be blessed, starting with restoring a right relationship with His Father. That's that's where all the blessing. That's the font of all blessing. And then He says, "Okay, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are." And you know, we went through this. So here are the things, the attributes, the characteristics, the lifestyles that bring about God's blessing in our life. But now we're going to drill down, so to speak, and see his instruction on each one of these. So we're going to start. There it is. There it is. Big Ben telling me it's time to start. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Electronics. So we're going to start. We're we're going to pick up where we left off, and we're going to start in Matthew chapter five, verse thirty-eight and thirty-nine.、Um, But I want to say this as we look at this and the rest of this chapter, the fifth chapter. I want you to think of this as the Lord's commentary now, or detailed instruction on on these. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Right now, because that's what the balance of chapter five. In this sermon is about it is detailed instruction on those things. Let me. I'm going to read through the whole balance of the fifth chapter, and then we'll come back and take it bit by bit. All right. So, starting in Matthew 38, Jesus said, "You have heard that it was said, 'An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth,' but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek." Turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, "You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." 
But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, I'm sure that if you've been spending any time in the Bible, you've probably heard these verses before. Many times, right? And if you are a Bible-believing disciple of Jesus Christ, well, that's what we're going to take a look at. Are we really believing what he said? Or are we kind of adjusting it to fit the way we live? Okay? And who's being conformed to it? Right. And... You know, and a lot of a lot of commercials and things will tell you, okay, they'll give you a warning. You know, this is don't don't attempt this at home, closed circuit, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. I want to give you a warning. And here's the warning. What we're going to look at here, I'm going to tell you right now, is difficult yes. to the flesh. Yes. Yes. It borders on impossible mm-hmm. to the flesh mm-hmm. or crazy. But we are spiritual beings who are called to appraise all things spiritual, mm-hmm. right? But before I go into this, I just want to give you this warning. And I'm going to just read three verses to you from John chapter 6. All right? John chapter 6. In verse, now if you know this, this is where Jesus had fed the multitudes and he comes across the sea and and people follow him. And they gather. And they've all all followed Jesus. And in verse 26, John chapter 6, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, You seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. I want to tell you that there are a lot of people sitting in churches today, a lot of people that call themselves Christians, and they are following Jesus because of what they get, what they think they're going to get from Jesus, that are things that feed the flesh. There are a lot of churches, a lot of quote-unquote very successful churches, that have built up mega churches because That's exactly what they offer people, is what attracts and feeds the flesh. But now he starts teaching difficult things. And in verse 60 of that sixth chapter, it says, Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? The teaching of Jesus is hard on the flesh. And in verse 66, John 6, 66. John, yes, 666. That's it. it says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. You better be prepared for the difficult things in the word of God. You better be prepared for that. Because Jesus Now, remember, this is a sermon that he is preaching here to his disciples. But I want to read you something else in the Gospel of Luke. This is what I want to read to you from Luke 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. You see, a lot of people are preaching today, it's about what you get. But the call to discipleship to follow Jesus Christ is not about what you get, it's about what you give. What you get is the gift of salvation, a restoration to the to the Father, a reconciliation with God Almighty, the Father, Yahweh. That's what you get. But you got to count the cost. And the cost is that you die to yourself, you deny yourself. And unfortunately, that's not being preached a lot in the Western world, at least today. It's time for us to get real. All right. So here. Let's go back now and take this a bit by bit. Go back to 38, 538, Matthew 538. Mm-hmm. 
You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Do not resist an evil person. No self-defense. Defend me, O Lord. Defend me, O Lord. If you don't understand that the Lord is the defense of your life, that what you are to do is to not resist an evil person. Now, I asked, you know, I said at the beginning, this is for Bible-believing Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, do you believe this? Absolutely. Well, the fact of the matter is, now, I, I just want to share something with you. When I was saved a long time ago, now, I had been raised a Catholic, but I had never read the scriptures. No, I, had no, I had no knowledge. I had no knowledge of God's word. I also had no knowledge of the Lord, right? But when no, I got saved, no I had... I can relate to what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah the prophet said, Thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the light of my heart, my life. That's what happened to me. The word of God, I, I, it became my joy and I devoured the word of God. I mean, I literally, Alice will attest to this. It's almost like you were melded. Well, I, I just, I spent every moment, every waking moment that I could possibly spend mm -hmm. in the word. But one of the things I did is I also, I wanted to know because I knew nothing. So I went out and I spent a lot of money buying this commentary, that commentary, that Bible study. I wanted to know what, what other people, and, and I can remember vividly. Yes, I can One too. night I was sitting there and I, had, I was surrounded by all of these books, my Bible and all these different commentaries. Mm -hmm. And as I was sitting there, is this not right? Yes, it is. All of a sudden, I just knocked all of those other books to the ground, to the floor. Yes, and all I had left was the Bible. And Al said to me, what are you doing? And I'm telling you that I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, I want you to know what I have to say to you before you know what I said to somebody else. Now, there's nothing wrong. Listen, God has appointed teachers in the church to build up, to equip the saints for the work of service. That's why we're here right now. So there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it's like the Apostle Paul. When, when he encountered Jesus, the risen Jesus Christ, on that road to Damascus, he says that he did not go. He didn't rush off to Jerusalem to hear and learn from Peter and James and John and the disciples. He went out into the wilderness. He learned from the Lord. Right. Later on, did he go and he met with them? Yes. And he presented what he was doing, right? Well, that's the way it was in my life. So I believe in commentaries. But I, I also believe, you have to remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to learn to hear from Jesus Christ. You need to hear from the Lord. Okay? So, in all these studies in years past, now I've been studying the word for, I've read plenty of commentaries by plenty of commentators mm -hmm. uh, from across the ages. I mean, you know, it's been, as I say, it's, the word of God has been a passion in my life. And when it comes to this verse, if you go back and look at some of the old commentators, you know, Henry, Matthew Henry, Barnes, I mean, go, go any of them. And when it comes to this verse, they start to get a little shaky. You know, does God really mean this? Well, well, you got to, you know, you got to defend yourself. But we come from a Christianity that has a history of the Crusades. We come from a Christianity that has a history of the Inquisition. We come from a Christianity that has a history of wars and wars and wars driven by religion. And even when they're not, you have both sides of the, of the equation saying, well, God's on their side. I don't know that God's on the side of anybody in, when it comes to violence. You should do a word study on violence in Scripture. Does this give you the... Um, uh, the perception or the uh, being an, uh, an uh, underdog? Oh, no, no. If, if you're in the flesh, it will. That, that's where I want to go. Right, yeah, if, saying, yeah. See, here's, here's what I hear all the time. And this is where it starts to get really right. Again. <clears throat> you know, when I start saying, okay, here's what Jesus said. And this is where you hear that word all, yes, all the time. Yes, but. Yes, but. No, there are no buts. Jesus said, mm -hmm. do not resist an evil person. Yeah. Don't resist evil. I have heard the heads of ministries stand up and say, no, we're not going to take this anymore. 
we've got to, you know, we've got to fight reach back. out. We got to fight evil. We got to fight evil. No, what we're called to do is to praise God. I mean, go, go, go look at Isaiah 42, for example. What we're supposed to do is sing a new song unto the Lord. We're supposed to praise Him. We're supposed to give glory to God. It says He will go forth as a mighty warrior yes. and defeat the enemy. Yes. Isaiah 42. Go check it out. Start at verse 10. So I'm not making this stuff up. And I've said to you before. Test what I say. I don't ask you to take my word for it because you shouldn't take anybody's word for it except the word of God. Test it and see if it lines up with the word, right? So it's not our job to deal with evil. Listen to what I'm saying and test it. And when I, you know, if I say to you, if I'm reading scripture and you, you have a problem with this, I'm going to say to you, you don't have a problem with me. That's right. That's you don't have a problem with me. Do not write to me at office at BibleTalk.com if you don't like this. Write to Jesus at heaven.org. I'm, I'm not quite sure that's it, but that's a reasonable guess. All right. Take it up with him. Don't take it up with me. He says, don't resist an evil person. Think of what Paul wrote in Romans. Romans chapter 12, right? So I'm going to start at verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I'm going to go someplace even more radical, I promise you, with this. Because this is an incredibly radical sermon. I've been saying that all along. That's not new. Now, it's not when Jesus said this, and this is what happens. People say, oh, so God wants you to be a footstool? Repent! Here's what Jesus said. He doesn't want you to be a footstool, but he doesn't want you to resist evil. Because I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 43. And if you've not read this, brother, that should be your homework assignment for the week. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be scorched, nor will the flames burn you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place, since you are precious in my sight. And he goes on. He says, do not fear, for I am with you. It is because the battle is the Lord's. So to deal with those who would do you evil, the Lord has given a ministry. See, he's, going to take, he's saying he's going to take care of you. And here's the way his plan, as near as I can tell. In order to protect you, God has given a ministry to the government, to the world. Let me just read you these. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, it says, It is he, God, it is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. You hear that? He removes kings and establishes kings. He's talking about world rulers. Now, you may think that here in the United States of America, you elect presidents. The fact of the matter is, if you know you got educated somewhere along the line, you, you know, first of all, presidents are not elected by common vote, popular vote. They're elected, they think, by electoral college. The popular vote advises the electoral college, and they select the president. You're all wrong. God selects. He appoints the rulers. Right now, I don't care what you think of Barack Obama, whether you're pro-Obama or against Obama. The fact of the matter is that man is in office because the Lord God Almighty wanted him in office for this time for and for his purpose. Now, I'm going to tell you something. His ways are not our ways, and I can't tell you what that purpose is, but I know that Obama is in office 
because the Lord wanted him in office. And he represents, in the eyes of God, the people of the United States of America. Okay? I'm going to read you something else, from again, from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Romans 13. Paul says, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. You want to have no fear of authority, but what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister. The government is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a, listen to this now, talking about the government in every nation, not just, not just ours. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, let me know. Yes, that is the ministry that God has entrusted to them. You don't have to go outside the church to see that not everybody that's in ministry is fulfilling their ministry that's that they're right. called. That's right. And if inside the church there are people who are not fulfilling the ministry that God has called them to, why should we expect that not to be the case out in the unrighteous world? Okay? But here's what it says. Again, Peter said the same thing. I mean, you know, it says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. You're hearing it from Jesus. You're hearing it from the Apostle Paul. You're hearing it from Daniel. You're hearing it from Peter. Right? Peter said, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Where? This is 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. So that is the ministry of the government to protect us from evildoers. God is saying, don't you do it. I'll put these people in place and they're supposed to do it. Got it? That's, That's what it. the scripture says. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about scripture. And it says, for such is the will of God. For such is the will of God. So, I mean, we're talking, we're Bible believers. This is what the Bible says. Okay, you can you can say whatever you want. You get upset about this, but this is what the Bible says. This is not my opinion I'm giving you. But Mark said, what happens when they don't do this? Because the fact of the matter is, they often don't do this. They often do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. And again, I'm going to say this, because in the Sermon on the Mount, what we studied a few weeks ago, was that we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be giving example and instruction to the world. And yet we see in the church a failure to do that. So why would we be, why would we, we be astounded or amazed at failure on the government? And, and if we fail to do what we're supposed to do, the world is supposed to be met. I figured the world would be mad at us for, for not doing what we should be doing. Well, no, they, know, they, don't, they don't want us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. Right. Because, remember, this present world is in the power of the evil one. That's what the Word of God says in, in the letter of James. But let's just talk about this now. It because sounds like your whole thing is doomed to fail. It is. <laughs> okay. The world just, is on a di downward spiral. Yes. You know, the, Peter, sure. Peter says Sorry, that this present fire. world is reserved for destruction by fire. There's no salvation for this world. No. We're, we're not, there's not going to be some kind of, you know... I, I'm, I'm getting a little off here, and I don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole too much. But the fact of the matter is I all over. And, you know, we are blessed to travel around the world and meet and, and minister in churches all around the world. Yes. And over and over and over, what I see is Christians are praying for this great revival that's going to come and everything's going to get. Many that's not, you know, but yeah. the simple fact of the matter is that's not what the word of God says. Jesus Christ, go back to the teaching. Are you a Bible believer? In Matthew 24, specifically, when the apostles, the disciples said to Jesus, right. tell us. What will be the signs of the end of the times in your coming? And he said, one of the things he said is there will be a great apostasy, a great falling away. Nowhere in there does it say there's going to be a great revival. It says there's going to be a great falling away. And you can go check what Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you're going to see the same thing. Okay? That's, this world is headed, it's not just headed, it is spiraling more and more rapidly, faster and faster, to the end, to destruction. Okay, so, so let's, let's just look. Before I talk about the government failing in its duty, I want you to apply this throughout your life, okay? One of the things it said here, Peter said, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. That's right. 
It says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. That's what it says. Yes. So all you women liberals, you can get upset as all you want. Quite frankly, I don't care. But again, do not write to office at BibleTalk.com. Check it out with him. Because I didn't originate this. I didn't think this up. I didn't make this up. So what I see is I've counseled with so many wives. And they say, you know, they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And they say, oh, it's because my husband didn't do it. That's you can't wrong. use that as an excuse. Yeah. If your boss is telling you to do something that you don't like, you can't. Re rebellion is as witchcraft. That is what the word of God says. To fail to obey authority in your life is witchcraft. You're practicing witchcraft. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about this and it's going to get radical and you're probably not going to like it. And when we start talking about it and you don't like it, here's what I want you to think about. Are you going to pull a John 6 and are you going to run away or are you going to test what I say against the word of God? And if it is the word of God, then you got to live it. If it's not the word of God, then I not I not only do I welcome it, I encourage you. If, if you see what I'm saying is not the word of God, do write to me Absolutely. at office at BibleTalk.com. But don't tell me what you think versus what I think. Because the word of God says, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, and he said, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for correction. If I need to be corrected, correct me with the word. Your opinion will never affect me. Uh, in the Old Testament, God gave a covenant to the Jews. And a, co and a covenant is different than a, con a contract because a covenant is... I'll do this, you should do that. But even if you don't, I'll do this. Right. God, yeah. I think what God gave us is a covenant for the world. And he said, look, you do this regardless whether they do that or not. Oh, yeah. What, what other it's people here, do? It's here regardless okay. if, if, if okay. the government okay. does what okay. it's supposed okay. to. Yes, yes. The, the point is. What somebody else does has no effect on what you're supposed to do. Exactly. Yes. That's you can never you can never have an excuse. Well, so and so didn't, or so and so well, did, or anybody then. else. Yeah. The responsibility here is between you and the Lord. You are supposed to be guided. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is supposed to direct your the path, path of your life, That's regardless right. of what anybody else does. But what I'm saying is. You have to watch out for rebellion in your life because if you think that somebody above you mm -hmm. is not doing right, that does not give you the right to rebel against them. That's right. Ever. Never, ever. Ever. It says in the end times, perilous times will come. Ours is an upward and onward calling. So we're, we're, we're going up and they're going down and the, the distance between the two over time is getting bigger. Of course. That's right. And it's going to be better. harder and harder to do. Absolutely. All right. So, but here's what I want to say then, right? right? You always have the right to appeal to go above that person in authority in your life. Okay. So wives, if your husband is doing something that you That's think right. is not right, you have no right that does not give you permission to rebel against your husband, right. but you always have the right to go over his head. That's right. Who is his head? <laughs> ah. If a government is not doing what is right, you have the same right to go over their head and appeal to the one who is in authority over them. And the one who is in authority is the author of it all. Jesus Christ is Lord. So you can take your appeal to him with confidence. You can go boldly before the throne of grace right. and make your appeal, your request made known to him. That's what you can do. I said that Daniel, the, the three people that I see doing the most specific teaching on submission to authority in, the, in Scripture is Daniel, Paul, and Peter. And interestingly enough, all three of them wound up in situations where they were totally and absolutely abused by people in authority over them. And I'm going to tell you right now that they lived what they preached. Yeah, they lived verse 30. Absolutely. They lived what they preached. Let me let me just get it here so I don't fall too hard. Find me far, far beyond. 
Okay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were given an unlawful command to bow down before a brazen idol, and they refused to do it. Were they wrong? No. Absolutely not. Because you don't have to obey. That's not a lawful law. Okay? That's, that's not in the realm of their authority. And it's most assuredly not in their realm. So they said, and by the way, so what they did is they didn't rebel. They didn't try and cause an uprising. What they did was submitted to that authority over them. But what they said was, we'll not bow down. But we're willing to suffer the, the consequence. consequence. Just like Peter did when he was commanded by the Sanhedrin not to preach the name of Jesus Christ. He said, no, I can't do that. But he was willing to suffer the consequences and was whipped and went out rejoicing that he was considered worthy to suffer shame for the sake of Jesus Christ. And Paul, the same thing. But Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went to a higher power. They went to a higher authority. They went to the one who was higher than Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And you want to know something? When they were, when they were, when they were sentenced to death, a horrible, fiery death, a torturous, we talk about cruel and unusual punishment, a cruel and un, I mean, tortuous punishment, execution. Mm -hmm. They were thrown into a furnace that had been made so hot that it killed the people who were bringing them there. And Jesus showed up. And you want to know something? He was the defense of their life. When Daniel found himself in the same kind of position and was told that he could not pray to his God, he did what was his habit. He didn't do something new. He didn't get posters and walk around and protest. He continued to do what he had always done. He went and prayed to the Lord God Almighty. Yahweh is his name. And for that, he was sentenced to death. And again, a cruel and unusual, maybe it wasn't unusual back in those days, they threw him into a den filled with hungry lions. But he appealed to the God who is the source of all authority, who sent an angel and protected him. And the people that would have punished him, they wound up eaten by the lions. Now, when he went down into that lion's pit, he didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know if he was going to be protected or not. But he, he was obedient. He was willing and he was obedient. Obedience is a, a okay. When Peter and Paul wrote what we just heard, what you just said, who was the Caesar? I think it's Nero. They, we went from uh, Caesar Augustus to, to um, oh gosh, don't make me do this from memory. To Is Nero, it? to Claudius, mm -hmm. to um, Caligula. Caligula. I mean, you have to understand that these Christians, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, what Mark is saying is true. Daniel, Paul, Peter, these guys wrote these things, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God yes. during the reign of some of the most horrible, unjust, ungodly world leaders that had ever been seen. Demonic. Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nero, Caligula. The, uh, demonic doesn't even Probably. begin to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. And yet still they are writing at to the will of God to be submissive to these governing authorities. And then trust that the Lord is a deliverer of your life. That's the, that's or right a lot of, you know what? Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego said, he'll deliver us. Or he won't. But it regardless, matter. he's God. He's still God. And if you look at that faith chapter, I hear people talk all the time from Hebrews 11. Now faith is. And they talk about how God's going to deliver you because you got faith. No, no, no. He will deliver you. But he will not necessarily deliver you from. He can deliver you through. Or out of, or he can, or he can say it's time to come home. Right, exactly. I mean, do you not think that Stephen had faith, and yet he was stoned to death? That's right. The Word of God says he was full of faith. Yes. Acts chapter six says he was full of faith, and yet the Lord allowed him to be stoned. But the Lord gave him grace. Grace. Did he deliver him? You betcha he delivered sure him. Did. How did he do that? Because it says Stephen's face radiated with the glory of God. They're in the midst of that persecution. You've got to believe that God loves you. That's why I read Isaiah 43. It's not like God saying, okay, you know, I'm just going to let you be abused. 
That's not what the Lord is saying at all. Not at all. But, you know, look at that hero's list of faith, faith heroes in, in Hebrews chapter 11. People who died in horrible ways, and yet the word of God, you know what it says is, the world just wasn't worthy of them. So the Lord took them home. God will deliver you. But this is, this is for you to renounce self-defense. Yes. I'm going to tell you, I am sickened. I can't tell you how many churches I have been into where I have met the people who have carried guns into the church just in case anybody bad shows up. Are you nuts? Excuse me. Okay. Defend me, O oh Lord. Who's more important? You know, I, I preached in a little black Pentecostal church just outside on the outskirts of New York City more than 30 years ago. And I said, you have to know New York City to really appreciate this, especially in the, in the Bronx, okay? Because these people were all ministering in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, back in the 70s, and it was not a nice place, oh, all right? No, 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 no. Half the streetlights in the South Bronx, I think, were, had been shot out, right? Uh, half the buildings in the South Bronx were derelict, vacant, uh, burned, out. burned out buildings that were filled with drug dealers and junkies and and I said to them you know imagine if you're coming down because these they had women who were going out at midnight they're going out in the dark at night handing out tracks to people that they met I said imagine you're going down and you turn around down an alley and all the lights are out I mean it's really really dark and you look down the alley and there at the end of the street or the end of the alley there's a bunch of guys you know and they're just mean looking Wearing hoodies, right? We're doing profiling. Yeah, there here. we go. Yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, back in those days, we called it st street smarts, but that's a whole other story. And I said, you know, you have options. You find yourself in that kind of situation, you have options. You, know, One, you knew you were facing evil. When you oh, I'm, I'm saying, yeah. you know, you went the, down that alley. You, you knew, knew facing evil. that that's not where you, you, know, you were that's facing right. evil. Exactly right. So you, one option is turn and run as fast as your little chicken legs will carry you. Okay. That not, might not work because they're probably faster. May not work. You're right. The next option is stand there and pray to the Lord your God that he will save you from those people. He's very likely to answer that. But the fact of the matter is you're not the one that needs saving. You're safe. They're the ones who need saving. And when we get to the place where we understand that their lives now are more important and more in danger than ours, your attitude begins to change. That's, they're no longer okay. in danger. So we're going to talk here about your worldly goods. We're going to talk about your life. Oh, wait a minute. I repent because that's not true at all, is it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Go back and listen to that teaching if you didn't hear it, or if you did hear it and you need to hear it again, because your life is not your life. You were purchased with a price. That's what the Word of God says. Paul said you are not your own. You were bought with a price. That price was Jesus Christ on the cross. You belong to him. It's not your life. It's not your money that you're protecting. Right. So, you know what? That's why you have no right to self-defense. Because you're not your own. But God does. You are his. The earth is the Lord's, David said, and the fullness thereof. The Lord said, okay, Peter, let me go back to Peter. For we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a people for God's own possession. You are precious in his sight. That's what I read to you from Isaiah. You belong to him. He, he will take care of what's his the way he wants to take care of what's his. But is your heart, you have the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. You have the heart of God the Father who desires that none should perish. Do you ever consider the fact that the person who is standing there threatening you with evil is more, far more in danger than you are? Absolutely. When you start to get that mindset, when you start to get that's the mind of Christ and the heart of the Father, maybe your attitude towards these things will change. And maybe 
the way that people look at the church will change. It says our goal of our the goal of our instruction is low. low, low, low. No. Sometimes that's hard. Yes, it is. That's the, the battle of the flesh. Okay, let me go back because I said I, I I haven't even gone to get radical here yet. Okay, no, no gosh. I mean, these are just the simple basic teachings of Jesus Christ. And the fact that uh, lots of people ignore them don't change the fact that they're just still the simple and basic teachings of Jesus Christ. Very obvious, very clear. They don't need a lot. Of, when, when, when Jesus Christ says, don't resist, the, those, you, how much commentary do you need? The only time you're going to need a lot of commentary is when you don't want to do it. Exactly. Where many you try words, to look, transgression yeah. is unavoidable. You try to look for a loophole. Oh, you'll study the Hebrew and the Greek then. Yeah. When you start looking for a way around it. That's right. But you want to know something? I've been saying this, which is why we've gone to the dictionary so many times in this study. Words matter. This may not be true of a lot of people, you know, but I'm going to tell you this. Jesus Christ says what he means. Yes, he does. Jesus Christ means what he says. All right, so I say... That the world has a ministry. Yes. All right. I, I pray that that's clear. And we have a ministry. They are totally separate. The people of God in the world. And one is justice, the other one is righteousness. One is judgment and punishment. All right. The world has a ministry of judgment and punishment. And we have a ministry of grace and reconciliation. Blessed are the merciful. Grace and mercy. We are supposed to bring the mercy of God into every situation. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. We have a ministry of peace, not to return violence for violence. All right? This is commentary on the Beatitudes. But if you recognize right now that the world has one ministry, and the church has another ministry, and they are separate. How can, I'm going to give you one other thing from the Sermon on the Mount right now. Jesus Christ said, no man can serve two masters. Not that you shouldn't. He said you can't. Impossible. So, I have a tremendous problem, but it doesn't matter what I have. But you ought to check out what Jesus thinks about all the Christians who are now commingling with the, world. with the world and becoming involved in any way in their ministry. Right. Because if you become involved in their ministry, you cannot. Let me repeat that. If you become entwined in the ministry of the world, you cannot fulfill the ministry of the Spirit. Right. Now, I'm going to share something with you. And this upsets a lot of my Christian friends. I refuse to serve on jury, serve duty, jury duty here in the United States of America. And people think that I'm a fanatic because I do that. Well, I pray that I am. And I pray that I'm radical because that's what this is about, getting back to the root. All right? I have been called a, a couple of times to jury duty, and I have declined to serve. Now, I'll tell you something right now that has yet to be put to the test. The last time I went, I was called to jury duty, and I went, and they bring you into a big jury room where all of the people who have been called for that day are assembled, and they ask, does anybody here have cause why they can't serve on jury or won't serve on jury duty today? So a lot of hands shoot up, and people say, well, you know, I've got to go home and take care of my sick father or, or something to that. And I raise my hand, and I say, well, I, I can't serve because of my theological beliefs. And I just got, got shoved off and ignored. They didn't, they wouldn't put this to the test. But let me, before you get, before you get upset or, or anything, let me explain something. Okay. I believe in the jury system. I absolutely believe in the American system of jurisprudence. Yes. I think this is right. It is the ministry of the, the government to punish evildoers. You can't punish an evildoer until you have determined that he is an evildoer. So the concept of having a, a, a jury come and let me just react. If a person is accused of committing a crime, then it's reasonable and just that a group of people independent of the crime, right? Separated. They're not victims or anything else. Right. 
a group of people who are separated from the crime and instructed in the law. Now, this is one of the things that happens in the jury system. Before they, before they sit down and before they go to deliberate, they are instructed as to what the law is regarding these, the, the, the accused's crime and so forth, right? So they, it's right that they should hear the facts of the case and determine if guilt exists. That's right. I believe in that 100%. I am wholeheartedly behind the American jury system. If guilt is determined, their judgment, by their judgment, they typically then participate in the sentencing of the guilty party. That sort of? Okay, so this that's is the way a jury, of jury, right, that's part of the ministry of the world, of the government, right? That's as it should be scripturally, but not for Christians, whose ministry is not judgment, but grace. Our ministry is grace, mercy, and reconciliation to God Almighty, not judgment and punishment. It's not that I'm saying that judgment and punishment is wrong or it shouldn't be done. I'm saying that we shouldn't do it. Because if you're doing that, you cannot, you're not in a position to bring the grace and mercy and of God and bring reconciliation to that person, regardless of guilt or innocence, regardless of guilt or innocence, to bring them, get them reconciled to God, right? Now, think of this. I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is, again, Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And he says this, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. You see, when we go into that kind of situation, if there are criminals in the world, and my goodness, you know that there are, if there are offenders, our job as Christians is to bring them the word of reconciliation through the cross of Jesus Christ. And it says, gave us a ministry of reconciliation, not counting their trespasses against them. You can't do both you can't serve both. You can do one or the other. So you also can't be a Christian cop. I, I'm going to tell you something, Mark. I had somebody a number of years ago ask me about being a Christian and being in the military. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, I say, I don't know how you can do both. You can't go out and bring this word of reconciliation at the same time you're shooting somebody. Right. You can't do it. And you know you can't do it. Right. And you can sit there and you can justify it every which way you want. Right. But I'm going to tell you, if you listen, if you're serious about this, go talk to Jesus about it. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'm asking you to talk to Jesus about it. We have been trained by the world inside the church yes. to be like the world. Be we continue to send our children back to the world to be trained in the government schools that can't do anything but teach the world system. In spite of the fact that God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah and said, do not learn the ways of the nations. We are doing this wrong. And it is time for us to examine the word of God. It is time to us get, to get back to the root. That's what radical is. And look at this first teaching of Jesus Christ to his apostles and disciples. And here's what he said. Do not resist an evildoer. The point is, if I wanted to kill you with poison, I wouldn't give you a glass of cyanide. Right. I would give you a glass of something that you like with a little cyanide in it. All right. So don't be surprised that the devil will get some things right. As they say, even a, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. Right. Okay. Now, I, I do want to say this before I go on. Right. I would most gladly take the time that they ask, that the government asks for my partici participation in a jury and, and spend it bringing the message of mercy and God to prisoners. I'd be happy to. It's not, I'm not trying to avoid the time. I'm not trying to avoid the involvement, but I can't serve two masters. I can't serve two masters. Now, the word of God says you can't serve two masters either, much as you might, might try. And I'm going to say this again, all right? 
Because the first message of Jesus Christ is not as long as the Sermon on the Mount. You know what it was? Repent. That's his first message. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. You, you've got to take time. It says, let a man examine himself. And the thing that you have to use to examine yourself is the word of God. We need to start looking at this word of God. This is a radical, radical teaching. Yes, it is. Jesus Christ was into radical, radical teaching. And like I said, many, it says, of his disciples walked away because it was too difficult. And when they did, you want to know something? You're not going to find a lot of sympathy from Jesus. No, You'll find the compassion of God. You'll find the love of God. But don't go looking for a lot of sympathy. Because he turned around to his own apostles and said, what about you? You're going to leave me too? You're going to leave too? He didn't go running after them. No, he didn't go running after anybody. And what he said was, or what the apostles said to him, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. These are the words of eternal life. You can choose to do it your way. You can choose to do it the way it's being done in most of the country, in the churches. Or you can choose to do it the way Jesus preached it. Are you really a Bible-believing Christian? Really? And the other thing is that he wouldn't ask us to do this and not equip us for it. No, the equipment is... The Spirit of God within you, who gives you the power and the strength to do it. And Jesus Christ, who gave us the example. What did he do faced with the absolute nuclear evil when he was confronted with it? By the world. That is, in John, the Gospel of John, when he is confronted by Pontius Pilate. You have to understand that Pontius Pilate is the legal authority representing the Caesar that you were talking about. He represents all of the power of the world. And he puts Jesus on trial. I find no guilt in him. He said, I find no guilt in him. How did Jesus respond? Well, then, you know, did he argue? Well, then let me go. Why didn't you let me go? He stood there. And Pilate said, are you, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you said. You know what? We have the example of Jesus. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have the word of God to give us instruction. We need to get serious. We need to get real. Because this is not happening. What I see is the church, so as I said, entangled, in, entangled in the world. Entangled in the world. That you are not, We're not doing either well. We're not, we're not, not doing, the, we're not we're doing not the world the good. And not doing the church good. We're not the light of the world. No. No. It's being... You can't. It's being... Completely covered with the world. world. So what do you do? Repent. It's as simple as that. And by the way, God disciplines those whom he loves. We repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. If you, Listen, there's something tingling at your spirit now. As you hear these words of Jesus, not these words of mine. If there's something tingling. Go to the Lord. Say, I, I, I want to be what you want me to be. It's that simple. It is that simple. But I have to tell you this. It is opposite of everything that the world teaches. And it, unfortunately, it is the opposite of what most of the church is teaching today. And what most of the church is practicing today. That's why Jesus said this way to destruction is wide. It's easy. And many are going that way. And that's why this way that we follow is narrow and leads to the, to the straight gate. It's straight to narrow. And few of those who will find it. He's coming back for a remnant. And that's why it's so, so important to fellowship with believers, with people, yes. strong believers. Who will encourage, encourage you, you to, to this, live the word this. in spite of, and I'm going exactly. back to this again, in spite of the cost. That's right. If God is calling you to do something, you've got to stop thinking about, oh, what it's going to cost me. That's right. You've got to count the cost, but then you've got to remember what he called you to. To give up all your possessions. Everything. Look at the next one in Matthew 5.40. He says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who recognizes that nothing, nothing. that nothing belongs to That's them. Right. It's not ours. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. All right. Whose shirt? Whose coat? It's God's. 
<laughs> this has got to lead to the story. Well, we had, we had a, a young fella in our congregation up in New York. And, and this is going back, he was a teenager. Oh, yes, he was. And going back into the, I guess this is a very late 70s. 70s. And he would go down, he played the guitar, he would go down into the streets of New York and he would just to share the gospel with homeless people. Yes. And he'd, play his, he'd take his guitar and play his guitar. And he went one night and he got mugged. Somebody robbed, it was winter and somebody robbed his coat from him. And as they were going away with his coat, it dawned on him and he started chasing them down the street saying, here, take my shirt, here, take my shirt. <laughs> and they wound up running away from him. Yeah, okay. And that's the way you're supposed to do it. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I, I, I just want to try and make this as clear as I possibly can. I'm not worried about offending. Because, you know, I've, it says in Psalm those 119, verse 165, those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. So if you get offended what I say, it's not because of me. It's because you don't love God's word enough. That's simply what it says. Most Christians have been deceived and are being too worldly, far, far too worldly, too, too entangled and involved in the world, in the politics of the world, in the military of the world, in the justice of the world. That's not what God has called you to. That is not the ministry that God has called you to. I read you what God has called you to. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You would have a ministry of reconciliation. You are supposed to bring, blessed are the merciful. Isn't that? Blessed are the peacemakers. You're not supposed to go out and do war. You're supposed to bring peace. You're supposed to bring God's mercy, not bring the judgment of the world. These are the things that Jesus is saying here. This is the Sermon on the Mount. If you don't like it, hey, do what they did in John 6 and wander off. That's between you and the Lord. That's not between you and me. But I beg you, I plead with you. Do what the Lord is asking. Be obedient. Because blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He only desires to bless you. He is not trying to take, turn you into a footstool, a footmat. He want, but he wants you to be humble. Right? Blessed are the humble. And then he says, he will lift you up. He will exalt you. God's purpose in life because you are precious to him. You are precious in his sight. He will, one way or the other, deliver you. He will protect you because you are his possession. Don't get into self-defense. Don't go out and defend the world. It has no hope. Go out and proclaim the words of eternal life. That's the only hope there is for people. Well... Please think about this. Don't take what you've heard here in this Bible study and think about it. Meditate on it. Go test it in the Word. Spend time. The best thing that you can do is go to Jesus Christ. And listen, don't be afraid. Say to him, did you hear what that guy Alan said? Did you hear what he said? What is he, nuts? And see what Jesus said. And if Jesus agrees with you, I'm nuts. Hey, he'll deal with me. But maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm just giving you the word of God the way you're not hearing it a lot of other places. Maybe I'm just telling you what Jesus said and saying it's time to get back and start living what Jesus said. Not just preaching happy sermons on a Sunday morning before we have coffee and donuts and head off to Red Lobster. This is about how you live your life. Living the righteousness that Christ Jesus so dearly paid for in your life. So, Father, we do. We thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for that gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, who did for us what we could not do for ourselves to make us right with you. Take away the stain of sin from our lives. Lord, that he did not come into the world to judge us, but to save us. And we thank you ever so much for that gift, Father, in Jesus' name. Use us for the glory of your name. Until next time, may the Lord our God bless you.